So we're good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is the second remote edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group event. It's a project of New America and the R Street Institute. Our topic today concerns Congress and its vital role in foreign affairs policy. And the Constitution gives both Congress and the Executive Branch foreign affairs powers, but while the Executive Branch's powers are broad, they are still limited. And to compare, the Constitution expressly allocates Congress a lengthy list of foreign affairs powers, not only to declare war, but to regulate commerce with foreign nations, to make rules for the government and regulation of the armed forces, appropriate funds, and to quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into the execution of those powers. More, Congress also plays an important oversight and investigatory role of our foreign policy. Yet too often, institutional and political barriers limit Congress's ability to conduct effective oversight and play a more active role in foreign affairs policymaking, limiting a key voice. Joining us today for this event is Lester Munson, who will offer his firsthand observations and his insight on how Congress can strengthen its voice in foreign affairs. Lester is a principal at BGR Group, a leading government relations firm in Washington, D.C., where he consults with foreign governments, corporations, and advocacy groups. Before BGR, Lester served for 26 years on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch. He was most recently staff director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He also serves as adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins University and a co-chair of the executive committee of Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. In a second, I'll turn it over to Lester for his presentation. But before I do, I wanted to let you know for those viewing on Zoom, there should be a button near the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Now there, that you can submit questions. Feel free to do so at any time during the presentation, and we'll reserve time at the end of the hour to take as many of those as we can for Lester. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lester. Okay, Anthony, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to people at length, even if I can't see them. Uh, this should be terrific, and it's also it's a great excuse to get dressed up, uh, which is uh, a valuable thing these days. So. I'll start uh, by making three kind of preliminary points. First, um, as, I, as I go through my presentation, I think people will see that I'm, uh, or, or hear me be a little critical of certain processes on the Hill, uh, certainly of the State Department and other things. I just wanna say at the beginning, I don't mean to criticize any individuals personally. I know a lot of the folks on the Hill who are working on foreign policy issues, they're by and large my friends, they're terrific. I think they do a great job. I don't want anyone to think that the stuff I'm suggesting is somehow dereliction of duty by them. I see this as more opportunities for others on the Hill right now to be uh, more entrepreneurial and aggressive and, and find opportunities to do things and make a difference. I'm not at all criticizing the folks who are currently there doing what is, I think, a very difficult and important job. Same thing at the State Department. I have found folks at State to be uh, terrific and uh, wonderful to deal with and very talented, et cetera. I think there are a lot of issues at State as an institution that Congress needs to deal with, and that's what I want to address here. I'm not trying to impugn anyone's uh, individual capabilities or abilities or, or posture or anything. Uh, and secondly, second preliminary point, uh, I want to say that I think, generally speaking, Congress does a very good job of addressing foreign policy issues. Um, a lot of the international programs that we have uh, are driven by Congress. A lot of the policies carried out by the executive branch, in fact, originated on the Hill. A lot of the controversial issues that we're seeing today, whether it's uh, how to deal with Putin, uh, what our posture should be vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, engagement in the Middle East, a lot of these issues are being addressed on Capitol Hill, perhaps not in a totally dispositive way, but the Hill is addressing those issues and that's important. So I wanna make the point that basically, I don't think this is a broken system. I do think there are opportunities for improvement. Uh, third preliminary point overall, and I hope this is infused through what I have to say uh, in the next few minutes, um, bipartisanship is really the key to foreign policy, both in the executive branch, but particularly on Capitol Hill. Uh, I, was, I was on a similar call uh, earlier this morning with someone who's a staff director of a, of a key committee on these issues on the Hill, a uh, Democrat, and he's make, he made the exact same point that really, uh, it's very difficult to get anything done on foreign policy issues, really on any issue without it being 
uh, based in bipartisanship. And so uh, if I go through and say something that appears to be partisan, I am a Republican, uh, I was a Republican on the Hill, I'm still a Republican. Uh, I don't mean it as criticism of Democrats or my fellow Republicans. I think in order for Congress to work well on foreign policy, uh, it's got to have a bipartisan effort. That's really, really critical. Okay, so with those, um, those caveats, I will uh, go ahead into the main body of my remarks. And I want to make, uh, kind of go through three fundamental things. And at the end, I will get to 10 recommendations that I have for things that folks on the Hill could look to do or engage in to make a difference on foreign policy. Uh, and I will also, by the way, free of charge, give you two book recommendations uh, that I think will be helpful for folks. So I hope you're taking notes. If you don't write down anything I say, at least write down the titles of those books. I think they're uh, terrific, and I'll get to them uh, in a few minutes. So first, I want to talk about what I think is a fundamental problem in the way, not necessarily a, a, um, uh, you know, a catastrophic problem, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed in the way the U.S. carries out foreign policy today. Secondly, I want to explain the reason that I think it is a problem. And then third, I will uh, address what I think are ways that this problem could be solved by folks on the Hill in particular. So the problem, uh, the problem I see basically in the world today is that the State Department is much in a much weaker institutional position than it should be in the carrying out of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, it should enjoy the prime position among executive branch departments, but it is substantially weaker and less effective than it could be. So let's, let's review a little bit of history. In the past 75 years or so, through, since the end of World War II, through the Cold War, through the post-Cold War period, the global war on terror and where we are today, our national security infrastructure has grown enormously. It's been professionalized. It's identified and solved many problems. Some opportunities have been missed. Uh, some crises have been misaddressed by either the intelligence community, the diplomatic community, the defense community, or others, but that's gonna happen. Um, Point being, we have an enormous infrastructure. Right now, the State Department spends about $20 billion a year. There's another 30 or $40 billion a year that's spent on programs, including foreign assistance. So it's a big, it's a big chunk of money. It's a lot of people. We're in a lot of countries. Uh, we have embassies and consulates around the world. Some of them are quite small. Some of them are quite large. Uh, we have USAID missions in uh, some of the poorer countries, many of the poorer countries, where often the USAID presence is substantially larger than the State Department presence. Back at Maine State in Washington, we have 24 bureaus, uh, many more offices, services, and bureaucratic structures. Simply put, our diplomatic and development bureaucracies are global, they're large, and I would say uh, they're unwieldy. And so when, when we think about Congress addressing foreign policy issues, there's a lot for, for the Hill to wrap its arms around. Um, I think the State Department needs to be reformed, strengthened, and better suited to the challenges that we find today. So let me give you some examples of places where I think the State Department is not necessarily leading where it should be. And these are, these are kind of broad topics. One is a uh, sanctions process. This is largely driven by the, by the Treasury Department, uh, the Office of Foreign Assets Control. There are other parts of the executive branch that address sanctions, sanctions issues, but these are invariably impactful on foreign policy and the State Department is not leading. It is other departments that are leading. Uh, uh, both Commerce, the Commerce Department and the Agricultural Department have their own foreign services. I don't think that's necessarily bad, but I think it's notable that uh, they're not based through the State Department. I would like to see the State Department have a little more control there. The Justice Department lately, <clears throat> if you're a follower of uh, international news, you'll know that the Justice Department in the U.S. is prosecuting foreign individuals for crimes, usually corruption related, that often have very little to do with the United States or its people. They're not crimes against the U.S. or against Americans necessarily. By the way, I'm not in favor of corruption. I just think it's notable that the Justice Department is pursuing these things and the State Department is not necessarily the lead uh, in resolving these questions. And of course, the Defense Department has American troops in dozens of countries around the world. On the ground, our defense commanders, our commanders in chief often have vastly more impact on US national security and foreign policy than uh, the diplomats that work with them, even ambassadors at the country level 
and in major countries do not have the same influences as our combatant commanders. Uh, I'll give one example of uh, uh, a situation where, where, Congress, where the State Department should have been leading and really wasn't, and Congress had to step in and address the issue. And that has to do with uh, a gas pipeline through Europe from uh, Russia uh, that was going into uh, Germany called Nord Stream 2. Uh, the administration wanted to, uh, the president was opposed to the pipeline. The president has the authority given to him by Congress to impose sanctions if he chose to do so. He did not do so, largely because the Treasury Department objected. It required congressional action. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz uh, was the driving force. Uh, Congressman Kinzinger in the House was also significant uh, to actually finally impose sanctions on uh, some of the entities involved in Nord Stream 2 to stop the pipeline, at least temporarily. The administration, the State Department, had a clear directive from the president that they could not get the job done. Congress had to step in and do it. I think it's notable that this major foreign policy initiative has to do with our relations with Europe and uh, Moscow and what we think of Russia. Uh, it took the hill to get things going. So what does is, what is the State Department need? I think it needs a better budgeting process uh, that is more willing to make tough decisions about putting resources against priorities rather than just managing spending changes from one year to the next. It needs a more streamlined operational structure. There really should be no more than three layers of bureaucracy between decision maker and the person who's executing that policy. Uh, it needs better training for its diplomats. By the way, these are all opportunities for, for Hill action. It needs better training for its diplomats and other officials, it needs to embrace the technologies uh, of the modern era. I believe this, this may have been overtaken by events recently, I hope it was, but until just recently, the State Department cables were still in all capitals. Uh, the State Department really ought to be able to embrace lower case technology uh, by this point, and I hope, uh, I hope that our communications are, are better than the way they appear uh, to folks on Capitol Hill. Um, most importantly, and this is really uh, kind of the, the crux of my argument, the State Department needs a better relationship with Congress. It needs to do a better job on Capitol Hill. It needs to understand the role that Congress plays in making foreign policy and use that to its advantage. It is a huge opportunity that has been missed by the past several administrations. It's missed on a regular basis. And I think it's missed so often that people don't even realize that it's necessarily true anymore. <clears throat> and that uh, this is almost as much of a problem on the Hill as it is at the State Department. There, there is a lack of an understanding of the, of the very critical nature Congress plays in executing U.S. foreign policy. So, um, uh, I will give you one example of this. Um, personally, uh, my last job on the Hill as the staff director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, uh, and I was talking to my counterpart in the Legislative Affairs Bureau known as H., uh, who was a friend from the Hill. Uh, I knew her well, uh, we're still friends. Uh, we got into a profanity-laced tirade about uh, the fact that the committee was marking up a State Department authorization bill. It was a very light State Department authorization bill. Uh, it was really a series of reports that were required with a few authorities thrown in. Uh, and we ended up swearing at each other on the phone because uh, the State Department was concerned about the Hill interfering in what it was doing. In fact, it's, it should be Really, the, by the way, we're still friends. Uh, we, when we joked about it just a couple months ago before the pandemic hit. Um, point being, people in, at the State Department uh, and the State Department as an institution needs to see Congress as an opportunity to do a better job. It needs to engage on the Hill. It needs to use the resources of the Hill. It needs to have buy-in from both parties on the Hill to be able to do its job properly. Uh, so that's, so I was an authorizer. I, my sense is, uh, from some of the various work I've done uh, through my career that with appropriators, and I've never been an appropriations uh, committee staff member, uh, those are very important jobs. I was never quite good enough to have one. Uh, but those folks, uh, I think, also have a very fraught relationship with the administration. It's a lot of times there's a lack of information that flows back and forth between state and the other foreign affairs agencies and appropriators to the point where Oftentimes, appropriation staff have to rely on outsiders, people in the advocacy community, people in the lobby community, my day job, I am a lobbyist now, uh, for information about what the administration is doing. I hope that's not as frequent as it seems to me from where I am now. Um, 
So what are, uh, what are some of the more particular issues that could be addressed at the State Department um, in terms of the way it handles Congress? One way is by being more present on the Hill itself physically. Uh, the Defense Department has offices in both the House and the Senate for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, for the Marines. They're staffed by senior officers. They're staffed by officers who are having uh, very good careers and are ambitious and are going to go to key posts later on. I believe uh, back in the day, uh, John McCain, who was an up and coming uh, Navy officer after getting out of Vietnam, was in the Navy liaison office. He had a pretty important career in foreign policy going forward. Um, the State Department doesn't do that. The State Department has a small office uh, that handles some visa requests on the Hill. They really need a more robust presence. I've brought this issue up previous, uh, with uh, folks from state in various situations. And often the explanation is, well, we just don't have the resources to be able to do that. I don't buy that for a second. Uh, the State Department has a $20 billion budget. It has offices all around the world. If it wanted to have a presence on Capitol Hill, it could have one. Um, the Legislative Affairs Bureau uh, mentioned earlier, H, known as H, uh, is a bit of a backwater, and I'm not impugning any of the folks who work there. It's a very difficult job, uh, but the way the State Department is structured, it does not reward the people who serve in the Legislative Affairs Bureau, and it ought to. That ought to be a destination for ambitious Foreign Service officers who are trying to make a career in foreign policy. They should be able to go to H for two, three, four years, make a difference by interfacing with key staff and members on Capitol Hill, and then go on to senior positions, ambassador, uh, DCM at key posts, things like that. Currently, that is not the situation. A Foreign Service officer who goes to the Legislative Affairs Bureau is not necessarily helping his or her career. Uh, it's, oh, it's staffed, probably overstaffed by political appointees. I love, I'm not impugning political appointees. I love political appointees. I was once one myself at USAID. Uh, I think they're terrific people generally of both parties, but there needs to be more uh, career expertise at the Legislative Affairs Bureau. That's going to be make for more sustainable relationship with the Hill. The, the political appointees leave when a new administration comes in. Often they're only there for a couple of years before they go on to some other assignment. It's the career folks who are there are going to be the institutional memory. They need to be empowered to go to H and make a difference. Um, uh, what else can we say about this? Um, uh, constituency. Folks uh, at the State Department will say there is no constituency for the, for the State Department on Capitol Hill, the way the Defense Department has kind of a natural constituency in uh, members of the armed forces, Marines, soldiers, airmen, uh, coasties, what have you. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think the State Department has untapped opportunities for uh, constituencies on Capitol Hill. Uh, millions of, you know, not now during the pandemic, of course, but before and hopefully again soon, millions of Americans travel internationally. They're going to have an interface with the State Department, even if it's just using their passport. Uh, they may be using consular services. Uh, many Americans uh, who feel strongly about their ethnic background, either because they're a new immigrant or they're one or two generations removed, are concerned about the policies in their home country, those ethnic politics, which play a big role on Capitol Hill, particularly in the House are an opportunity for the State Department to also engage with the American people. And I'm not saying the State Department should go lobby Americans for, uh, for it, what it's looking for, but it should know that there are people out there who care that the State Department uh, be fully funded, that it be doing a good job, and will back them up uh, when, they, when they need assistance. So I think that's a, that's a missed opportunity. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, something that, that Anthony mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, the congressional authorities uh, that are given in the Constitution relating to foreign policy. So, first of all, uh, top uh, kind of top cover issue, Congress comes first in the Constitution. Uh, it's Article I. Uh, it is a lengthy article. There are uh, many, many authorities given by the framers in the Constitution to Congress. It is vastly more authorities than that given to the executive branch. Yes, they are co-equal branches. If you just if you read the text of the Constitution, I'm not a lawyer, certainly not a constitutional scholar, but I think any lay person reading the Constitution will realize there are huge authorities given to Congress. Uh, generally speaking, it comes first, the president comes second. By the way, the State Department is not mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, 
uh, Congresses. There's plenty of time our framers spent on the Constitution, the authorities it has. Many of them are in the foreign policy realm. Uh, let's let's take a look at some of those. Uh, raise armies, maintain navies. That is basically uh, Congress's job is to come up with the funding and the policies and the support for our military. We'll leave that aside during this talk since we're more focused on foreign policy than defense policy, but it's obviously a critical component of a lot of things we're doing. Uh, the power to declare war is solely belonging to Congress. Uh, Congress approves treaties. Congress approves appointees. Uh, in, the, in foreign policy, that's hugely important since uh, every single one of our ambassadors, uh, and there are more than 150 of them, have to be confirmed by the Senate. Many senior officials at the State Department, at the Assistant Secretary level and above, I think there's 35 or 40 or so of these officials, need to be confirmed by the Senate. It's vastly more than any other department. The, the State Department is dependent on the Senate for its personnel a lot of its key personnel, all of its key personnel. Congress, of course, has the power of the purse. Uh, no money can be spent without Congress authorizing it and appropriating it. We'll get into some of those uh, differences soon. Uh, and of course, letters of mark and reprisal are a uh, congressional authority. Hasn't come up lately, but perhaps if uh, piracy takes off here uh, in the pandemic or shortly thereafter, Congress can uh, take another hard look at letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, perhaps a missed opportunity. So let's let's take a look at some of these issues individually. Uh, declaring war, it's a big one. Uh, it's uh, obviously one of the most important things uh, the government does, perhaps the most important. Uh, Congress doesn't really declare war anymore. It authorizes the use of military force. Uh, those authorizations have uh, come to be called AUMFs, uh, a little inelegant. Uh, but the authorization for the use of military force, the last ones we had were in 2001 and 2002. Uh, the 2001 AUMF in particular, uh, which authorized force against the perpetrators of 9-11, uh, is very much in use currently here nearly 20 years later. Uh, there is a concept of associated forces. In other words, any uh, terrorist group that could be considered to be associated with uh, the terrorists who carried out 9-11 uh, is seen as covered by that AUMF, and the U.S. can use military force against that terrorist group. That's been that's been quite stretched. There's been a lot of criticism saying uh, that the that the Congress should reauthorize the AUMF. I think there's some legitimacy to that concept. Um, in Libya, uh, during the last administration, there was the U.S. used military force uh, against the Libyan government. It was never explicitly authorized by Congress, and you could not make the connection to 9-11. Uh, that was uh, the subject, by the way, of a terrific, <clears throat> excuse me, a terrific article by former Senator Jim Webb in National Interest. And if, and if you want to um, take a look at a, at a really good, uh, uh, well thought out, but strong argument in favor of more of a congressional role in foreign policy, I, I urge you to look up Jim Webb's article in National Interest regarding Libya. Um, but I think uh, there's another side to the story that may be more important, which is Congress has addressed the issues related to the 9-11 AUMF in many ways since 9-11. Uh, since it's funded uh, an enhanced national security ar architecture. It has funded specific programs to train and equip allied forces in the Middle East and elsewhere to help fight uh, terrorist groups, it's effectively endorsed this expansion of the 9-11 AUMF and the use of this associated forces concept. So while I think there can, there's some room to talk about Congress doing more in the, in the AUMF area, in, in fact, a lot of that is happening and it's happening almost on a regular basis. If you look at the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, which uh, you know, it's an annual process. There is invariably some funding for programs related to the 9-11 AUMF. So effectively, Congress is endorsing a lot of the things we're seeing today. Uh, let's talk about uh, treaties. <clears throat> the Constitution uh, gives the Senate the, uh, <clears throat> the authority to review and approve treaties. It's a high threshold, two-thirds vote, of course. Uh, and I think when 
uh, and again, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but but if you read the constitution, the the, the language of the constitution, uh, it looks like the Senate should be playing a critical role in international agreements that the president negotiates. Also, you can uh, imply in the Constitution and in the Federalist Papers that explain the thinking behind a lot of the provisions in the Constitution, that the Senate itself should be directly involved in the negotiation and the consultations involved in making the treaty. We'll get to, get to that a little bit more in a second. It's a hugely important role. <clears throat> and so today, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, today, very few of our international agreements are considered treaties. They're considered low, lower level agreements. They're not submitted to the Senate for approval. I think that's an opportunity for Congress to act, and I'll get to that in, in a little bit. We talked about approving appointees, um, the number of ambassadors, the number of senior folks at the State Department uh, that, are, that require congressional interaction specifically in the Senate. <clears throat> State Department is very reliant on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to give it these key personnel. Uh, it's, it's an important point of authority for the Hill and an important point of leverage in the negotiations that go on over foreign policy, of course. Uh, the power of the purse, spending, we talked about. Uh, the appropriations process is eroding a little bit. Nevertheless, monies have been appropriated every year uh, in, in the recent history, whether through bills directly, through continuing resolutions or what have you. The, the process is not terrific. I'm not meaning to insult any of my appropriator friends. There are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, it's, it's eroding, but it's functional. The authorization process, uh, and by all means, ask me a question about authorizing and appropriating if, um, if, if this is too complicated or too simple. Uh, in the authorization process, the process has com almost completely broken down. There hasn't been an annual uh, authorization for foreign assistance since 1986, which was uh, so long ago that it was before even I was an intern on Capitol Hill. Uh, and we haven't had a State Department authorization bill, a full State Department authorization addressing all of the authorities and uh, approving all of the spending since 2003. So for foreign aid, it's been two generations. For the State Department, it's been almost a generation. It's really a phenomenal. Uh, 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 lack of, of full authorizations. I should say, in the meantime, there have been uh, some piecemeal authorizations that have occurred that are, are, that are very significant. I, you think of the Nunn Luger program, uh, which authorized a lot of spending and activities to help dismantle the Soviet nuclear architecture, whether it was hiring science, scientists or um, uh, providing for the destruction and um, of, of nuclear uh, weapons and the uh, processes and, and, uh, and facilities needed to make them, hugely important. That was an authorization bill. Also, uh, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, which I happened to work on a little bit on the Hill and in the Bush administration, which spent billions of dollars to save, really, I think, an entire generation in Africa and elsewhere, hugely significant. That was an authorization bill. So while the authorization process itself has, is broken, there are some things that happen uh, that are hugely important to our foreign policy still on the authorizing side. Um, again, no recent examples of letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, I, I challenge congressional staff to come up with a way to make that relevant again today. So what are some other examples? <clears throat> uh, and here I'll get to my first book recommendation. <clears throat> Legislatively, of course, uh, aside from all the things that we've mentioned, Congress passes laws. Those laws impact uh, what the president can do. They give him authorities. They give him uh, resources to spend. Uh, an excellent example of this is the Taiwan Relations Act, which uh, set the frame for the U.S. relationship with Taiwan in the wake of the U.S. recognizing Beijing and de-recognizing Taipei uh, as the, the Nixon-Carter foreign policy initiative to uh, effectively bring China to our side during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. The Taiwan Relations Act was a critical uh, piece of legislation that let, that paved the way for Congress to support this policy shift. It uh, certified that there would continue to be U.S.-Taiwan relations. The U.S. would continue to provide uh, defensive weaponry to Taiwan to have an economic relationship with Taiwan. We continue to have diplomacy in a way. It's the State Department, but it's not the State Department. Um, 
Uh, and, and so that act, which took quite some time on Capitol Hill, is the subject of a book. So this is your first recommendation. Uh, it's called Bridging the Strait, a Legislative History of the Taiwan Relations Act by a guy named Martin Gold, uh, Martin Gold, uh, who's a friend. And if you, uh, if you know the name, it's because he wrote the seminal textbook of Senate procedure uh, called Senate Procedure by Martin Gold. Uh, so I recommend Marty's other book on the Taiwan Relations Act. It's a terrific read. It's a great in-depth analysis of how hearings, lunches, legislative tactics in committee and on the floor made a huge difference in the way uh, the U.S. carries out policy towards Taiwan and China. Very, very important work. Um, let's talk about uh, treaties. I think there's an opportunity to go back to the original intent of the Senate on treaty making and treaty approval <clears throat> and invite senators to be part of treaty negotiations, of international negotiations with other countries, or at least to be consulted along the way as those agreements are, are written out and framed. Uh, not too long ago, President McKinley at the end of the 1800s uh, used members of the Senate to help negotiate a peace treaty with Spain that was eventually approved. Uh, one of his successors, President Wilson, after World War I, specifically chose not to use senators <clears throat> in the negotiation of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, even though he was urged to do so by prominent members. That treaty, of course, spectacularly failed. I believe it was voted down twice. So there's, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, the administration, and the Senate should insist on this, for members of the Senate to be involved in treaty negotiations. Uh, I think, for example, of President Obama's effort to craft the Iran nuclear deal, hugely important to his administration. I think he missed a big opportunity to include uh, folks who were Iran hawks, but perhaps willing to look at creative ways to contain Iran in that conversation. Instead, uh, we got a deal, and, and we may get questions on this because I'm, I'm going to make some assertions that may irritate people, uh, a weaker deal that ultimately did not get congressional approval, in fact, arguably was rejected by Congress, uh, implemented anyway, and of course, the next administration came along and pulled the U.S. out of that agreement. Um, I think had the administration been a little more creative, worked a little bit harder on including congressional concerns, that could have been an opportunity to make a big difference. Um, uh, I will, I, let me get to my second book uh, recommendation, Harry and Arthur by uh, a guy named Lawrence Haas, who I think is an old Al Gore staffer, Senate guy, of course. Um, Harry and Arthur refers to Harry Truman and Arthur Vandenberg. Arthur Vandenberg was a Republican from Michigan. He was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. <clears throat> Harry Truman, as you may recall, was uh, vice president under President Roosevelt and took over when Roosevelt died. Uh, the two of them uh, had a partnership that led to the approval of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the United Nations Charter, uh, aid to Greece and Turkey when the communists were uh, making headway in both of those countries, the Marshall Plan that bolstered uh, Western Europe uh, in the face of famine and economic devastation after World War II. Uh, so they worked on the, together on these, uh, these critical things. They're still with us today. Arguably, they need uh, a fresh look, uh, and that's another opportunity for the Hill. But uh, the president and the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of different parties worked together to create the structures that got us through the Cold War very successfully and uh, you know, for, for a generation or two since then. Uh, an amazing feat. Uh, there's, there's other areas uh, where Congress uh, has played an important role in making a foreign policy, support for the state of Israel, uh, bipartisan, uh, deeply popular. It uh, impacts US foreign policy decision making on a regular basis, containment of Iran, it was Congress that pushed sanctions regimes for years before the nuclear agreement uh, on Iran, concern about uh, Iran's support for terrorism, its role in the Middle East, the fact that they'd taken American hostages back in 1979, all of those issues. Um, and really, it was the congressional support, uh, the, the bipartisan congressional initiative on Iranian sanctions that I, I would argue 
led to the opportunity for the administration, the Obama administration, to negotiate the Iran nuclear deal. Now, I happen to think the negotiation didn't produce uh, the best possible outcome, but the fact that it was even possible was because of congressional action on Iran. Uh, today, uh, there's a bunch of uh, issues, there are several important issues where Congress is uh, making a difference on foreign policy. The big one kind of sitting out there on the horizon is China. There's a story today in the Wall Street Journal about Senator Tom Cotton uh, introducing a bill called the FORCE Act, which would uh, spend some money, create programs to change our defense posture in the Asia Pacific region, uh, region to contain China. There is no corresponding legislation on uh, on State Department activities. There should be. It would be good to see what a, uh, a congressional diplomatic initiative on China would look like. I think it's interesting that Senator Cotton um, uh, has come up with this defense policy. We should, we should look for foreign relations and foreign affairs committees uh, to come up with a diplomatic version of that. So there's this huge nexus, uh, I would argue, between successful U.S. foreign policy initiatives and support on the Hill. <clears throat> okay, I'm now going to get to the final part of my talk. Give me one moment here. Um, and I want to give 10 um, opportunities, <clears throat> and I've numbered them. There are, in fact, 10 uh, opportunities for the Hill to make more of a difference in foreign policy issues and uh, also at the same time build its relationship with the State Department and empower the State Department. By empowering the State Department in certain ways, Congress can actually empower itself to be more involved in foreign policy issues. First, um, anytime Congress gives an authority to the president, whether it's to impose sanction, economic sanctions or tariffs, it should include limitations on that authority. Sometimes the limitation may be uh, in the calendar. The authority may expire after five years or three years or one year. More importantly, perhaps, there should be an opportunity for congressional review of actions taken by the president under those authorities. Uh, one of the things uh, that we did when I was last on the Hill uh, working on the Foreign Relations Committee was include a mechanism for congressional review of, economic, of waivers to sanctions that Congress had imposed on Iran as it, uh, it, with regard to the Iran nuclear deal. So we passed a bill called the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, which provided for uh, the administration to interface with Congress on the nuclear deal that it negotiated with uh, Iran and the other five parties. And in, in that bill was a mechanism uh, that allowed Congress to review any waivers by the administration. It, it set a window where the administration could not waive anything, so Congress could review the agreement, and then after that, Congress could vote on those waivers. I think that's an important component, particularly when the Hill is uh, the author of the policy, the administration carries it out, Congress should retain the ability to review that policy and change it if it thinks necessary. It should be a high bar for changing it, but there should be a, a mechanism in there. Uh, and that could apply to tariffs as well, not a foreign policy issue per se, more of a tax issue. Certainly on the Hill, it's not foreign relations or foreign affairs, but I think similar things could be said about uh, the president's ability to impose tariffs. I'd like to see more congressional review of that. Uh, foreign assistance spending mechanisms. Uh, right now, this administration uh, has been um, not carrying out the will of Congress in regards to foreign assistance spending. It has attempted to slow down the actual spending of the funds through various bureaucratic means. And then it has also, for the last three years, attempted to rescind funds that Congress had designated for foreign assistance issues or foreign assistance programs. Uh, Congress should not allow that to happen, except under very specific circumstances, should not allow the administration to play games with foreign assistance programs that Congress has decided should be implemented. Uh, and we can talk about that more. That's, that's a, um, uh, that issue may go by the boards because of the pandemic, I hope. Uh, but if it doesn't, it's something that will come up again this summer when the administration attempts to rescind uh, billions of dollars in foreign assistance. Uh, agreement making authority, kind of alluded to this earlier. The, the Constitution specifically gives the Senate the ability to approve international agreements. It's called treaties in there. There are plenty of agreements below the treaty level that are important on occasion. The, the uh, executive branch should be able to do those. I think there should be a higher bar for 
uh, those international agreements, there should be more scrutiny from the Hill of those agreements. I think it's a, it's a big opportunity for members, for the committees to address this issue. Perhaps you could come up with something similar to the congressional notification process, where when the administration wants to make a change uh, in spending, it has to send a notice to the Hill. That notice can be put on hold. I would like to see uh, a mechanism whereby the Hill could put on hold implementation of international agreements that it has not approved with uh, the assumption that eventually that hold would be let go once specific issues were addressed. I think that's a big opportunity. It's, it's rather neglected. Uh, there are, by the way, there's a, um, there is a law, it's called the Case de Blocky Law, that requires the administration to report to Capitol Hill on all of the international agreements that are enforced, called treaties enforced. And it's a, it is merely a list of international agreements. It's about two inches thick. Uh, there's a phenomenal number of agreements out there that deserve scrutiny. Many of them are going um, uh, by without any congressional interest or even knowledge uh, that they exist. Uh, four, I remember four, the promotion of foreign service officers. <clears throat> so in addition to approving uh, ambassadors and senior State Department officials, the Senate has to approve all foreign service officer, uh, foreign service officers and their promotions. Generally speaking, these are done en masse. There'll be a list of 800 names that are uh, folks being promoted from one level in the Foreign Service to another. I think there needs to be more scrutiny of these. The Armed Services Committee does a better job of scrutinizing military promotions, and I'm not trying to put any kind of onus on Foreign Service officers. I think they will be better served by a tougher process on the Hill, higher standards, and more congressional involvement in the diplomatic core. I think that will, anything that we can do to tie the diplomatic core to their elected representatives, I think is a good thing. And Congress, the Senate in particular, should be more involved in, uh, in these promotions of FSOs. Uh, another issue, item number five, this may not be politically doable. It is possible, this is just my subjective opinion. I think we should eliminate donor ambassadors. And I do not mean eliminate political appointees, I think, we should, but I think it would behoove the Senate <clears throat> to eliminate uh, and not approve nominees who are merely nominees for ambassador, who are merely the nominee because of their financial support to a successful presidential candidate. Frankly, I think that's selling uh, a, an important, a critical senior American national security position. It's uh, these positions, there are usually 40 or 50, I think it may go up to 60 in the current administration, political appointees. The majority of those are merely donors. Some of them are, some of the political appointees are quite qualified and if they, and if they meet qualification thresholds, I believe they should be approved. But if they don't, and they're merely there because of the money they raised, they should not be approved. These are uh, the ambassador position <clears throat> Uh, abroad is the person who leads the State Department and all other U.S. government agencies in that country. They're the head of the country team. They're the president's representative. If the Senate doesn't take those people seriously, I don't think anyone will. It's crazy to me that there are uh, folks who essentially buy positions, I'm not casting aspersions on them as individuals. They may be terrific humans, but we should have very well qualified people as heads of mission as our ambassadors abroad. I think that's a big opportunity for the Senate to make some reforms. Uh, reporting requirements. Uh, many, of the many of the pieces of legislation, many of the bills today that are related to foreign policy or foreign assistance are in fact reporting bills. And, they, uh, and these pieces of legislation, some of which are quite interesting and very good, will lay out a policy goal and then require the administration to craft a strategy or write a report that addresses that issue. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's being relied on way too often. Uh, there should be a higher threshold for Congress demanding a report from the administration. I think the first thing the Hill should do if it feels a report is needed is write the report itself. If the Hill, if the committee, if the GAO, the CRS doesn't have the uh, wherewithal to be able to do it themselves, Congress should give itself uh, the resources it needs to do some of these reports themselves all too often reports from the, from the executive branch that are required <clears throat> in legislation are, make no material impact on the Hill. Oftentimes they're not even read by the people uh, who wrote the legislation requiring them. It's an, it's an opportunity of reform would help both the State Department and the Hill. 
Um, I want to get into uh, another sensitive issue. This would be I, this would be suggestion number seven: uh, the structure of committee staffs. And uh, this is I'll make a recommendation here. And again, <clears throat> I'll go back to my previous comment. I don't mean any of this as criticism of folks who are on the Hill now or what they're doing. I think, uh, and, and the folks I'm talking about now, I know are doing terrific jobs. I just want to pose this as, a, as an opportunity for a different way to do things. The authorizing committees need to legislate. They need to have a regular foreign relations authorization process. They need to authorize State Department authorities. They need to authorize foreign assistance authorities and uh, talk about budget levels for those programs. They need to get back to authorizing on an annual basis. The best way to do that is to go all in and restructure committee staffs in both the House and the Senate uh, around the programs and the functions of the State Department and USAID. So that'll mean fewer staff devoted to regional issues or, uh, or um, some of the other bigger, more highfalutin foreign policy issues. Instead, you would have a more robust staff focused on how money is actually spent. Congress rarely looks at the Foreign Service itself, how that money is spent, promotions, uh, pay levels, that kind of thing. There should be a lot more scrutiny where the dollars are actually spent. Congress needs, to, so the Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs Committees should restructure their staff so that it looks more like the Armed Services staff and that there are people devoted to certain uh, programs. They know them. They know how the money is spent. They know where the money is well spent. They know where it's not well spent. And then through an annual authorization process can address those concerns. I would imagine a staff like that would be less partisan than the staff is now. Right now on the Foreign Relations Committee, for example, there's about 20 Republican staff. There are about 20 Democrat staff. There are five or six so-called non-designated staff who are nonpartisan, but they merely uh, they're, they're terrific people and they do a good job, but they don't address policy issues or legislation directly. I would, I would like to see a return. I think something that could be considered is a return to a robust nonpartisan staff, experts on the functionality of State Department and other foreign policy agencies, including USAID, MCC, all of the other foreign aid agencies, so that uh, when, the legis when legislation is drafted, so there's a base text, is something that comes from a nonpartisan place that both Republicans and Democrats can support. One of the reasons foreign relations and foreign affairs is popular at all, frankly, is because of those bigger issues, the regional issues, talking about China, talking about Russia. The committees are, should still do that. I would have fewer staff resources devoted to it. Members will make statements. Uh, a lot of people think foreign relations is a speech-making committee. That's partially true. Uh, they should continue to give those speeches. A lot of those speeches are going to be partisan. When it comes to legislating, it should be more of a nonpartisan focus. You can restructure the staff accordingly. You can adopt the, uh, the model of armed services in terms of what the staff responsibilities are. You can also look at appropriations and the information control that they go through and the timing they go through to effectively legislate every year. That means having a draft bill that is held uh, so that only a few people know what's in it. Both key members are, know what's in there. You slowly uh, expand the circle of people who are involved, make sure that they have buy into the process, and eventually you come up with a bill uh, that can become law. It's a big lift, it's a big effort. I think that's a huge opportunity uh, for the folks at Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs right now. <clears throat> Secondly, or excuse me, eighth, eighth on the list, uh, the Hill really needs to help the State Department reform, revamp, and modernize its systems. Uh, one of the issues the Hill should be looking at, I think, more seriously is foreign service training. The Foreign Service Institute has a lot of good programs. Most of them are language-based. Um, I've seen uh, information, and I can't verify that this is true, that up to two-thirds of our language training is for Spanish. Uh, that seems, while it's important, there are other opportunities for training that I think are more important. I would like to see the State Department focus more on leadership training, management training, uh, modernizing its, um, its human resources in a way that other agencies have done. The intelligence agencies are much better at this. The State Department could learn a lot from the CIA about how its officers are trained, uh, and they will have, uh, and they, that will result in, more, in a more effective department. Congress should be pushing them to do that. Uh, more cyber training. Uh, a lot of uh, the challenges we're facing today are in the cyber realm. 
State Department is lagging behind other bureaucracies that, that needs to be fixed. Uh, area number nine, where um, folks on the Hill could make a difference, uh, strengthen the Legislative Affairs Bureau at the State Department. Uh, legislate that the Foreign Service is, Foreign Service officers are rewarded for serving in H. Um, uh, make that a more attractive destination. Uh, the State Department has a program called Pearson Fellows. There are not enough of them. Pearson Fellows are Foreign Service officers who, who are deployed to Capitol Hill for a year or two to lend their expertise to specific members of Congress or committees. Those should be made more robust. Uh, and the folks who participate in that program should be rewarded in their careers. That's happening a little bit now. I think it could happen more. And then my 10th item is uh, basic blocking and tackling. And this is oversight, oversight, oversight. There is always an opportunity for oversight to make a difference. And I will, I will bring up one example uh, from my time when I was in the administration uh, at USAID. Uh, where, by the way, even as a legislative affairs, uh, I was the head of legislative affairs for a while, rare, I rarely dealt with the Foreign Relations Committee. I dealt a little bit with the Foreign Affairs Committee. The group I dealt with the most was Senator Tom Coburn's staff on the Government Reform Committee. And I, um, and I commend Senator Co the, the late, great uh, Dr. Coburn uh, and his staff for doing this. They tortured us at USAID over our malaria program. Malaria program at the time was about $90 million a year. It was largely policy advice and reports for countries that were grappling with malaria. There was very little in the way of uh, medicine or uh, insecticide or bed nets that were actually helping people deal with malaria. Instead, there were a lot of reports. There were some conferences. The money was not terrifically well spent. Senator Coburn and his staff identified this uh, they brought it to our attention in, in a uh, uh, rather face-to-face -face way. My colleague, Michael Miller, uh, had to testify. It was not a pleasant experience. Uh, I think he had to testify twice, but it caused the administration to review its spending on malaria. We made a bunch of changes. We recommended an increase in funding, and the, and the result today is the President's Malaria Initiative, which is uh, much better funded, three or $400 million a year, saving millions of lives through actual provision of medicine, bed nets, uh, some creative insecticide programs that had been previously not used. Uh, but that was entirely because of Senator Coburn, who was not even on the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, addressing an issue. He conducted oversight. He had some smart staff. Later on, uh, when I was in a position to do so, I hired one of them uh, because I'd rather have them on my side. Uh, but that's, that is always an opportunity for folks on the Hill. Oversight, 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 the basic blocking and tackling uh, of Congress. So uh, I will uh, conclude there, uh, but make one more point that I think this is a, a, a time of great change. Uh, and it's not just coronavirus and pandemics and the need for a more sensible approach on global health issues uh, or the challenge of China uh, which is, um, uh, by the way, uh, all in the news today. There's a, there's a terrific article by Walter Russell Mead, an op-ed on uh, Senator uh, or former Vice President Biden's policy approaches on China and other things. There are great opportunities for bipartisan agreement on a new way forward. The world is changing. Uh, the administration gets a little distracted by the day-to-day -day activities. By the way, that was completely anticipated by the framers. If you read the Federalist Papers, you will see in there they knew uh, that the president would be distracted by the events of the day. Congress is meant to take a longer term view to see the opportunities and challenges and make sure the US government is pointed in the right direction to defend the interests of its people. So my last point would be uh, kind of a call to action for people who are on the Hill. Now is a great time to get involved and try to launch some initiatives and uh, get your feet wet. All right, Anthony, I'll leave it there. Hopefully there are some questions. Yeah, Lester, thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's been incredibly helpful. We do have some, pres or we do have some questions. I'm gonna try to go in the order they were asked. If I run out of time, I apologize. But the, the first question we got asked, in terms of sanctions, um, what are the justifications for giving Treasury authority over sanctions in the first place? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> 
Uh, I suspect that because uh, sanctions <clears throat> uh, have to do with uh, the U.S. government using its authority to block certain economic activities rather than the per se carrying out of foreign policy interests and values that ended up at the Treasury Department. Uh, and you, and once you've got a foothold uh, bureaucratically, things tend to grow. I don't mean that in a bad way necessarily, just kind of how things work. Um, uh, so you've got the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the at the Treasury Department. There are consultations with state. Don't get me wrong. There is a there is a usually a person uh, at the Assistant Secretary level who works on sanctions issues, but the lead agency really is the Treasury Department. And often the biggest impact of the sanctions is on foreign policy. I think the State Department should have a much more leading role in that issue because of that reason. And there are two questions that talk about it, both um, that talk about executive sanctions and the next one's talking about treaties. So I'll start with executive sanctions first. And this asks how Congress can best review unilateral executive sanction regimes. Um, and it gives a few examples, but what are potentially the best methods that Congress could use? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, the Congress, the, the president has so many different ways to impose sanctions that often when an announcement is made about the president making a decision that he's gonna sanction a certain individual or a certain country or part of a country's economy, uh, the most interesting part of the announcement is which legislative authority he decided to use. Um, all of those authorities were given to the president by Congress. Uh, IEPA, the International um, Inter Economic Emergency Powers Act, is one of the main ones that's used probably the most frequently. Uh, I think there should be a review of that authority. There should be some constraints placed upon it. Congress should have the ability to review the decisions made related to IEPA. Right now, it doesn't do it unless, you know, Congress could always pass a new law, of course, to stop the president from doing a certain thing. That seems, that seems awkward. That's, uh, too heavy of a lift, it seems to me. If Congress is gonna give the president the authority to do something, which they have done on multiple occasions with sanctions, they should also include a mechanism for congressional review. This is starting to happen more and more, by the way. I think uh, CASA, the big uh, uh, multilateral sanctions bill that came out, I think in the summer of 2017, uh, contained a lot of these review mechanisms. That should be included in everything that Hill does. And the, the next question goes back to the discussion that you talked about earlier about treaties and executive agreements. And I would mention there is a article that's forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review by three well-known international law scholars that look at the growth of executive agreements. And in their own paper, I think which is gonna be published at the end of this year, they conclude that the executive branch does not even come close to meeting its current reporting duties. Um, they argue the entire process is opaque, including to executive branch officials, and Congress is failing in its oversight of this sort of transparency regime. And so the question that was asked, um, I was asking your thoughts on whether Congress should have legislation to ensure that, con that uh, Congress or the Senate should formally approve um, withdrawals from treaties or other accords, and maybe what would a regular process to review our treaty commitments look like? Uh, that's a great, uh, it's a great question. <clears throat> There's a bunch of answers. Uh, one is every treaty or agreement contains within it its own withdrawal mechanism. Uh, so Congress should be reviewing those withdrawal mechanisms. Should you, There's no reason Congress couldn't insist on uh, or the Senate couldn't insist on a role for the Senate when approving a treaty for the withdrawal mechanism. Uh, basically, the, the Taiwan Relations Act was a response to the president needing to withdraw from the mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. So those withdrawal, the language for withdrawal of an, from an international agreement is critical. There needs to be a lot of scrutiny. Uh, I, I'm a Republican and I guess ostensibly a fiscal conservative. So I'm reluctant to say Congress should just hire a bunch of staff uh, and do a better job of scrutinizing these things. But if I were a Democrat, I would probably say exactly that. Uh, there'd be, I think there's some merit in that argument. Right now there's 40 people working on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it's not nearly enough to keep up with what's going on. They rely on people at CRS, they rely on uh, people at GAO, inspectors general, folks in the agencies themselves. Congress could uh, take a look at those resources and maybe marshal them a little bit better and maybe add some. 
uh, staff uh, capability so it can better scrutinize those things. Okay, and we'll try to answer the last two questions pretty quickly. The very first one um, is looking at appropriations and asks, um, what could be done to reassert Congress's power of the purse generally with respect to Pentagon spending specifically? Um, they mentioned the question, it seems like the defense space is particularly complicated since Congress authorizes spending in largely one bill, which makes it difficult for individual members to have a say outside of amending that specific bill during the appropriations phase. Uh, well, allow me to disagree with the question. Um, uh, yes, defense spending is massive. Uh, there's, there's probably a lot of wasted uh, money. I think that's true. A lot of it is being spent for political reasons to gain support for the overall program. I personally am not totally opposed to that. I think there's some value in that. Uh, but defense spending, by comparison to diplomatic spending or State Department spending generally, is pretty well scrutinized. Uh, You've got an appropriations process and an authorization process that happen on a regular basis. With the State Department and foreign aid spending, there is only an appropriations process. By the way, the number of staffers working on the appropriations committee spending uh, 50 or $60 billion a year is, is quite small. Uh, less than 10 people in the Senate, uh, less than, I think, eight people in the House. Uh, they do a lot with very few resources. They, they deserve our thanks. Uh, but the, on the defense side, it's actually a much better uh, situation in terms of congressional scrutiny. All right. And the final question asks, um, if you were a staffer new to the Hill and your boss was currently not involved in foreign policy, what steps or what advice would you give to a junior staffer to get their boss into the game and into foreign policy decision making? What issues would you choose and what steps would you take? Yeah, so there's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, a couple of things if you can do it. One is to get the, the member to travel. Members of Congress should go travel. They should go to uh, key countries that are allies. They should go to countries that are more challenging. Uh, traditional first trip is to Israel or to Ireland or to Italy where there are a lot of cultural ties with American, uh, Mexico, Canada. Uh, getting a member out of Washington into the real world, see things as they are, see what other countries are up to, talk to foreign governments, that's an important step. Secondly, staff should be educating the member about his or her constituency. Who, where, where did your constituents come from? Uh, are, there, are there new immigrants from certain countries that are voters in our district? Those, you should pay attention to those folks. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes they will organize based on uh, ethnic issues or things that are happening back in their home country. The member of Congress should know about those and when appropriate, be acting on them. Uh, the House in particular is, is an appropriate place for that. Uh, a lot of the Eastern European uh, constituencies have done a good job of organizing uh, politically in the United States. I think it's a, it's a terrific thing to have happen and members should be plugged into those political issues and dealing with those, uh, those voters and those people in their districts. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone again for their questions and thank you most to Lester for this incredible presentation, spending time with us today. Thank you for, thank you for uh, joining us and thank you again, everyone, for watching. We'll have another one of these events soon. And in the meantime, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony.